Okay. Um, welcome everyone. Mary Beth, do you want to start? Sure. Um, well, welcome everyone. It's really nice to have you with us today. And I am uh, particularly pleased uh, to introduce someone uh, who I consider a friend, Rochelle Winkle Wagner, and she is going to be talking about um, some of her research. Uh, and it's research that I remember learning about a long time ago, and she's been working on for a long time. And so um, hopefully um, you'll really enjoy it. But I did want to just spend a minute telling you a little bit about her. And actually, Rochelle, I'm not even looking at a bio. I'm just going to say that um, you don't even need to. Yeah, just <laughs> so that you all know, um, Rochelle is a professor in um, education, leadership, and policy and, um, analysis at uh, the University of Wisconsin in the Ed School. And I have known her for a long time. Um, I, I, I met her uh, at a conference um, and we, uh, I think, shared a cocktail or something and just talked. And I've been a mentor to her. And when I was at Penn, she was a visiting uh, professor and I've watched her and her husband, who's also a professor um, in political science. Uh, uh, I've watched their whole careers, um, including them getting tenure together and everything. And I feel very honored um, to have that privilege. Um, so most of her work, uh, for those of you who don't know her, and I am the person who recommended her for this, um, is it's uh, focused on issues of student identity and race and um, a variety of other um, context issues. But one of the reasons that I also wanted you to all to meet her is because she is, um, from my perspective, by far one of the very best qualitative methodologists around there, around um, a, across any discipline. And I, I, I'm not going to say that lightly. I, whenever I am uncertain about how to do something, I just pull out one of Rochelle's books because I know that she takes qualitative methods more seriously than anyone I have ever seen. Um, there is a really wonderful book that I keep near me all the time that I use and have cited in a lot of work and cited methodolo methodologically, theoretically, for context. Um, it's her book called The Unchosen Me, which was published by Johns Hopkins a while ago, but I just feel like it's still incredibly relevant and um, beautifully, beautifully, beautifully um, demonstrates qualitative research and how to be a, a caring and critical scholar. Um, and um, I also wanted to just say, that um, Rochelle is um, not only a wonderful researcher, but she is an absolutely terrific mentor and advisor. And one of the things I love about being connected with her on social media is to see those that she advises, um, thanking her and engaging her uh, around her mentorship. And um, I have two of my, my mentees who are now her mentees, um, uh, Vanessa and Danny, who um, Vanessa just uh, finished her uh, PhD dissertation and Danny is a professor now in, uh, in at OISE in uh, Toronto, right? And um, these are folks who were, uh, were uh, worked with me and I felt very, very safe uh, sending them to Rochelle and her and her team. So she's also a really amazing mentor. And then I also want to say in this time period that we're living, Rochelle is also the mother to two young women. And um, and so, you know, she's a professor. She's an ama a researcher, a wonderful teacher. And she's also a mother in the midst of this pandemic. And I watch her just um, really role modeling how you can do your very best. I'm not going to say do it all, um, to do your very best um, in, in a difficult situation. And so, um, you know, maybe you'll ask research questions, but if any of you are trying to balance a lot of things, Rochelle is the person who can do that. And so that's my very personal introduction of you. And I'm so excited to learn from you, Rochelle. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. I'm just delighted to be here with you all today. I'm I'm really, um, really, really honored that that you asked me to come and be with you. And I'm just um, so happy to be here. So, and thank you for the beautiful introduction. I'm I'm uh, I'm very touched. I'm going to try to share my PowerPoint. Make sure that it um, comes through. So maybe give me a thumbs up if you're seeing um, a presentation set of slides, which is good. Um, good, thanks. Uh, so I'm going to use this today as a as a chance to um, have it be a little bit of a 
a playground of ideas. Uh, I'm, as Mary Beth said, I'm um, talking about a project that I've been working on for um, ever, <laughs> maybe too long. Um, and um, I've recently realized that the, the struggles that I've been having with getting my book manuscript together is because it's not just one book, it's really two books. Uh, after I cut um, 300 pages out of the first manuscript, I realized <laughs> It's not, it's not one book, it's two books. So I'm, I'm playing with this offshoot book that I'm um, working on with my, uh, with some of the people that were in the study with me. So, um, so I'm really interested in your feedback at the end. I'm interested in your questions and uh, we can have a nice conversation. I'm gonna try to keep really good track of time uh, so that um, we end at 12 or one o'clock um, is, and so, I want to make sure that I give you 20 to 30 minutes uh, to ask some questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna endeavor to do that. You're also welcome to um, you know wave at me as we get closer to that too, because I want to really make sure we have some time to talk to each other here um, towards the end. And also, you know, as I'm going along, if people have questions, I'm also happy to engage questions in the, in the middle. Um, I'm happy to just have a conversation. So. Um, I'm going to talk through um, just a central uh, question that guides all of my work, which is about how students and faculty of color survive and or thrive in higher education and really beyond that into their lives. Uh, and so today um, and, and for a long time, my work has um, centered the lives of Black women. Um, I'm interested in how Black women have survived um, and, and maybe thrived in higher education when it wasn't built for them. Um, there are some instances of institutions that maybe were built for them, and we'll talk about one today. Uh, but most of the most institutions of higher education were not really built for Black women and their success, and yet many Black women have been successful. And so I'm also interested in what that means for their lives. I'm going to I'm going to preview. So if you were reading the book, this would be like the end of the book, all the way to the end, the answer to the question about how black women have been able to um, have, make it through these institutions that weren't built through them is um, with with community with other black people and particularly black women um, and and by working together um, towards a collective notion of greatness that is um, intergenerational. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context here in a minute. I'm going to give you a brief um, social science -y, uh, summary of the study. I'm going to give you an overview of one of the books that's the offshoot. Um, so the, the work I'm talking about today is probably the least developed in, in the sense of it be, being put into a book because it's going to be a new book now. Um, and then I'm going to give you um, two sample um, parts of sample chapters that I've written um, with um, with two women um, that are their oral histories. Um, just a quick note on language. I'm going to use Black and African Americans simultaneously. Uh, I often use Black to be more inclusive. Sometimes, um, especially older Black women um, who refer to themselves as African American, I may use that um, and Black together, uh, depending on what participants used. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about here women who identify as such. I'm not asking questions about um, whether or why they identify as women. So if they identify as women, I take them at their word for that. Uh, and um, higher education um, after secondary education um, is what I mean by higher education. And uh, I'm talking about two types of institutions, predominantly white institutions that I will refer to as PWIs and, and historically black colleges and universities that I will refer to as HBCUs. Um, as I think about race throughout my talk, I'm thinking about race as structural, socially constructed, and also interacted. So I'm thinking about race as all three of those things at once. It's structural, it's being socially constructed every day, um, and it's interacted every day. So happy to talk to you more about that at the end too. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of disciplinary perspectives I'm drawing on here, which is a lot. I've always, I've always fancied myself to be an interdisciplinary scholar, and uh, I, you know, as I um, have have gotten to a different chapter here in my career, I've really um, noticed that um, I'm really leaning on that interdisciplinarity in my work. Uh, so I consider myself a critical, um, critical scholar, uh, which means I pull from critical theories. I center a lot of my work in higher education as sort of my social context for the work. 
Uh, I use a lot of critical perspectives, meaning critical social theories. Uh, and I, um, when I think about um, race um, and a lot of critical theories, I think about the field of sociology specifically. Uh, when I think about racial theory, I'm gonna, I often turn to black feminist thinkers. Uh, and then I'm um, entering uh, a, new, a new era for me, which is um, thinking more and more about history and historical contexts and how that ties into my work. So uh, I'm drawing on all these different perspectives in my work um, some new to me and some not so new to me. So um, this is a lot to look at on a slide, but I'm going to I'm going to just distill it down to you. Um, so when we think about black women's lives, um, as we look at black women nationally in the United States over time and, and currently, um, we we need to know that black women um, across across the country earn um, less money um, in the aggregate. Um, than other groups of uh, men and women, um, that Black women are, um, have, a, have a very high poverty rate, particularly compared to white women. So almost one in three Black women um, would, would be in poverty nationally. Black women have a higher incarceration rate um, as compared to certainly white women um, at a rate of three to one. Um, and even Black women who um, achieve what we might call success, meaning they, they go to college, maybe they go to grad school, they have these high power careers, even Black women who are high socio socioeconomic status and who have high educational attainment have uh, worse health outcomes than many other racial groups and certainly um, worse health outcomes than um, white women um, and um, many groups of men too. So I gave one example on this slide. Happy to talk more about that. My, my current work right now is about Black women and health. Uh, so we can talk about that at the end if you want. Um, and yet, while Black women have essentially been, um, been oppressed in many ways in society in the United States, they have demonstrated um, immense self-determination and agency. I'm going to give everybody a chance to just look at this slide so maybe you can take a picture and go read these books. One of the things I really like to do as I as I talk about my work with black women is to highlight and elevate the work of other black women. Um, I identify as a white woman and so I really want to um, make sure as I'm presenting that I'm always elevating work of particularly black women uh, who are writing about their own lives. Um, so these are all um, works in that regard and you should check them out. So common claims that we make about education, Black women are doing well, you might even hear that Black women are doing better than every other group. Um, it is the case that Black women are, are enrolling in college at, at um, high rates as compared certainly to their Black male peers. Um, it is the case that Black women are doing better and better in enrolling for college, gaining access to college. Um, but when we turn the page, to um, how Black women are doing. This is nationally across all post-secondary institutions, two-year and four-year institutions. Graduation rates are not looking as good, particularly when we compare Black women to women of other um, racial and ethnic backgrounds. So there is, there is a case to be made here that we really need to know what's going on with Black women. We wanna know why and how Black women are um, persisting through college when and if they are. Uh, and what that means for them. So we need more. We need a more nuanced picture. I'm not the first to say this. Black feminist thinkers and critical race feminist thinkers have been saying this for a very long time since since actually the 1800s. Uh, so you know, many people in that in that camp um, of black feminist thinkers um, have talked about when we said you know when we talk about race, we talk about men. When we talk about gender, we talk about white women. Um, people have said this over and over and over through time. I've said this in my work too, but I just want to note that I, when I say that, I'm building on a very long tradition of Black women saying that for themselves. We need more intersectional approaches, um, and um, women's lives, who, Black women's lives, are often narrowed down, meaning um, they're essentialized, even in research that is supposed to center them. So um, some of my own work and my own review of, of the research that's been done on Black women um, suggests that we often emphasize individual factors. So we, while we may look at groups of Black women, we, we ultimately um, think about individual success. 
Um, we, we often don't look at Black women as compared to each other, so we, we compare Black women to other groups, which, um, which means that often we end up with deficiency approaches, meaning that we, um, we think of Black women as somehow um, lacking something uh, because we're looking at uh, a, the wrong comparison groups in my, in my view. Um, and we often frame success in ways that maybe Black women are or aren't framing it themselves, so we need to be thinking about that too. How do Black women think about their own success? Some of my prior work, and, and Mary Beth talked about this a little bit in, in the introduction. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about this because this was published a long time ago in 2009. Um, my early work with Black women um, in, at the undergraduate level at a predominantly white institution, a, a big research university, um, I, I spent a year um, with a, a group of Black women, just following them around campus and meeting with them. And um, the big finding there was that um, Black women didn't feel like they could just be who they were in that space. They felt like the identity was often imposed or outside of the realm of their own control to choose who they could be in that space. So that's the big thing we need to know. Um, as we think about um, this work that I had done earlier, um, the work really suggested that Black women, as they were feeling as if their, um, their identities were being imposed on them, they felt as if they had to choose between these polarized tensions. So I'm either too Black or I'm too white. I can't just be me in the middle, whatever that means. Um, I'm often either spotlighted, so hyper visible, or I'm invisible. I can't just be somewhere in the middle, just a student like everybody else. Uh, so there was this set series of polarized tensions. Um, but I started to really wonder, you know, why was there not much data in that project? I spent a year with the women. Um, why wasn't there much on resistance? Why weren't they resisting um, this idea of what I was referring to as the unchosen me, these imposed identities? And uh, I even went back to the data and reanalyzed it to try to figure this out. Um, I, you know, I, I puzzled through and, and talked to a lot of people and also read the reviews of my book to try to, to, try to puzzle this out and, um, and, and decided that maybe it was because the women were so young, they were 18 to 22, all of the women in that prior work, um, and they were just in the middle of it. So sometimes when, when we are in the middle of something, we can't always um, say, this is how I resisted it. So I wondered about um, talking to older women. Um, and I wondered about uh, success stories of older women, so people that had graduated, which is what we're going to talk about. I wanted to go beyond deficiencies. Uh, older women have, I, I thought, and I have found uh, really significant insight to share, um, and there'd be a lot of lessons that we could take to the future. So this is my, uh, I'm happy to talk about methods at the end. This is my very brief um, social science explanation of this project uh, I called the African American Women's Alumni Project. It was a critical oral history project, five cities. Um, I, I toured around um, for 10 years and um, interviewed women in Atlanta, Chicago, Detroit, New Orleans, and Omaha. Uh, I often, when I was traveling, would bring gatekeepers with me who um, are, were, at the time, most of them early career academics uh, who had deep roots in those cities. And, um, and so I'll talk about those folks in a minute. Um, ultimately, there's 105 people in the project. Um, 36 of them went to HBCUs for their first degree, for their undergraduate degree. Um, 69 went to PWIs, predominantly white institutions, for their first degree. Happy to talk more about this. I do want to um, draw your eyes to the positionality. Um, I am a white woman. I, I um, am not from these cities. So it was a lot of bridge building um, and a lot of um, work with gatekeepers, people who had roots in those cities who um, have, have come this whole journey with me. Um, so this is one of the, I, I know that um, this article, I think maybe went out to the group. Um, and this is one of the um, pieces that I published from the work. This is with some of my gatekeepers. Um, um, Bridget, Courtney, and Tangela um, were big gatekeepers for me in the study, meaning that they, they traveled with me and worked with me um, in some of the cities that I um, was going to. Um, the big finding here um, from the project was that Black women were able to find an authentically me um, idea of, of who they were um, when they built community with one another. So that's, that's the big finding here. Ultimately, though, um, I want to move beyond the social science ideas of the project and start thinking of it at this second book as a historical project. 
Um, and so that's what I'm going to play with here the rest of the time we have together. Um, I, so I have these, as I said, 105 critical oral histories. Um, these were Black women who graduated from college between 1954 and 2014. Um, and then I'm profiling at the bottom here um, some really great work of um, Black authors who've done work um, either with Black women or uh, on Black education. So I'm going to let everybody take a picture of that in case you haven't read those books, you should, um, and highlighting those histories. Okay, so the two oral histories I'm going to talk about today, one is um, by a woman that um, goes by a pseudonym that she chose her, we're going to call her Janelle Johnson for the rest of the day. Um, she is co-authoring with the, this with me, but she um, is, is using the pseudonym. The other is by somebody um, named Erin Grossier Mitchell, and her condition is that she absolutely wants to be named as, um, as her real name, so she is not using a pseudonym here, as you'll um, learn here in a moment, too. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about their oral histories next. But first, I want to I'm going to talk about the, the oral history in the PWI first from Janelle Johnson. Um, you know, PWIs, predominantly white institutions of higher education, have been segregated, racially isolating um, ant spaces. And um, they've also been spaces of a lot of agency resistance, protest, and community for Black students. So that there's these kind of tensions between the segregation, isolation, um, and then the resistance community um, and protest. And so um, here are a few more books that you might wanna take a peek at that are um, good histories and or works about black students. As we talk about Janelle Johnson, I wanna highlight one more history about, um, she, she graduated from the University of Iowa and um, this book, Invisible Hawkeyes is a, is a history project about um, some of the first Black students that went to the University of Iowa. Part of Janelle's story is, um, is emphasized in this book. I'm not going to tell you um, which part or because she is using a pseudonym, but um, this was a book that she and I also talked about together as we were thinking about her uh, chapter here. Um, so some things you need to know about Janelle. Um, it's a pseudonym, as I said. She was born in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and um, she was born in 1954. She was born the year that my, the other person we're gonna talk about went to college, um, but she was born um, during Jim Crow segregation laws um, still happening in the South. Um, and even, you know, um, we can arguably say in the North too, but um, in, in different ways in the North. Um, she was born the year that um, Brown versus the Board of Education happened, which would, was supposed to integrate our schools racially. Um, so she was really born at a time when we still had very segregated schools. We still had a very segregated country, uh, and we were maybe working on some of that. Uh, and um, she was definitely a part of that. She graduated from the University of Iowa with her bachelor's degree in 1972. She began college the year that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Um, she began college four years after the Civil Rights Act in 1964 um, happened, which um, would say that racial discrimination was illegal. And so her college uh, experience is really part and parcel to the civil rights movement, and she was part and parcel to much of what happened with racial integration at uh, the University of Iowa. She later earned an MBA. Um, in the 70s and a PhD from Georgetown in the 90s. And I'm blurring some of those dates a little bit because, um, because I am trying to still use the pseudonym for her. Um, she is, um, is still actually a professor. Um, she's technically emeritus, but she's still teaching. Um, so her story starts, um, we're gonna start her story today um, in high school. Um, I'm going to let you read through this as you desire. I have um, boldface typed some important parts. So she went to an all black high school. It was during the time when um, schools were supposed to be integrated, but she was um, technically living in the South in Missouri. Uh, and um, her school was all black. She said that she could count maybe three students in her school who were white um, and they were not from the United States. So um, she was class president. She was incredibly involved. She was a very, very good student, straight A student. 
Um, so she starts, she starts talking about this day when an athletic recruiter comes from the University of Iowa to recruit some of particularly the black men um, at that time to go play football and basketball uh, for the University of Iowa. So he comes to her high school um, and, and, and University of Iowa at the time was trying to use her school in Kansas City as this pipeline to bring in more um, black athletes in particular, but black students to the university. So she talks about um, she had this really, really great high school counselor and, um, and the high school counselor told this recruiter, um, you're not going to get the transcripts for the athletes until you go and talk to this table of girls. So Janelle had, um, as a class president, she had the, um, the ability to write herself class passes. So she spent a large majority of her, her days in her senior year um, outside the counselor's office. She and the counselor were very close. So she would, she would write her friends out of class. So they were sitting outside the counselor's office at this time. And, um, and so she, the, the counselor, who is a black woman, um, essentially made the recruiter, um, the athletic recruiter, go and talk to um, Janelle and her friends um, about the University of Iowa. And um, she, she um, actually reinforced with him that he would not be getting any names of the boys until, um, until, she, um, until he th talked to these girls about, about Iowa and going to Iowa. So um, by May of 1968, she, um, Janelle was still having a really hard time getting access to um, most of the predominantly white institutions in her area. She had been rejected from all of them, even though um, she had a 4.0 GPA and was class president. Um, and so because this happened, this is really the reason she went to, um, to the University of Iowa and to a four-year institution. She was actually going to go into the military because she'd been rejected from other predominantly white institutions in her area. Um, I also want to just note that this high school counselor, um, not only did she, was she the, the, the entree, the access point into college for um, all of these girls, these three girls, but she also paid for their application fees. She signed all their forms for housing. Um, most of these girls had um, parents who had high school educations and, um, and, and knew, wanted their kids to go to college, but didn't quite know how to work that system. Um, and so this Ms. Quincy, as we call her here, um, even paid the postage um, on, the, on the, um, the applications. And so she was really part and parcel to them getting it. She gets to Iowa and, um, and um, Janelle becomes very, very involved in the civil rights movement. Um, so they, they were doing protests all the time. They were, they were part of the, the mainline civil rights movement, um, but they were bringing it onto campus. She was part of the Black Student Union. She was part of bringing the Black Student Union to campus. Um, one night there was a, an arrest at a bar. Um, there was a fight between a black student and a white student, but only the black student got arrested and hauled off to jail actually. Um, so Janelle and her friends um, loaded up 40 kids and uh, 40 students at the time and um, went to the president's house um, and knocked on his door and, um, and he came down and said, well, you know, bring your, bring your friends on in. So this is an important moment because this white um, college president at the time chose to really try to listen to the students that were protesting at his house at three in the morning. Um, so he's in his robe, he's in his pajamas and he sits down and says, you know, come in, let's have a conversation. Um, and then he tells the students, why don't you elect four or five people, you know, try to solve what we can tonight. We'll try to get this student out of jail for the night. Then let's, let's solve the problems here. Let's try to figure out if we can help this so that that doesn't happen in the future. Uh, we'll sit down next week and we'll try to figure this out. Um, Janelle was, of course, one of the people that was nominated. Um, so she met with the president. She met with um, a series of other people who were um, big actors, including the chief of police at the time. Um, and they wrote a manifesto uh, about what had happened and, and racial disparities in policing and also just on campus. Um, and then she continued to work with this president um, in this role. Um, for many years to come actually on his um, racial integration policies and trying to do better racial integration work at University of Iowa. They stayed in touch for over 20 years. He wrote letters for all of her jobs, for grad school, everything. Um, she even came back to Iowa and worked um, for, with him um, at a certain point in her career for a period of time. Um, all of this comes at a cost though, and, and this is something that has um, driven my work um, forward in the future. 
Um, Janelle, you know, became so activist. Um, she, you know, she joined Black Student Union, um, a sorority, um, and then she was doing all this protesting um, that she got really, really sick after her first year in college. She actually had to leave a month early at the end of her freshman year um, and just completely collapsed, essentially. Um, she, and as she says it, she studied protest and partied herself into really bad health. Um, and, and she didn't, she wasn't really to come back healthily um, until her sophomore year. Um, and she struggled with health every year um, from then on uh, because she was doing so much work for the university, um, unpaid labor as a black student. Um, um, and yet it was making the world better, but it was, um, it definitely came as a, as a cost to her. I'm going to I'm going to flip to the other side because I want to make sure we protect time to talk to each other. Um, so I'm going to flip over to the um, oral history that is at a historically black college in HBCU and I just want to note that um, while predominantly white institutions were racially segregated spaces and many um, would say, including me, that they still are in many instances. Um, historically black colleges and universities, because predominantly white institutions were racially segregated spaces, um, historically black colleges and universities did have a mission to serve black students. Um, that mission did not always include black women as well as maybe it could have. Um, but uh, I do want to just note that HBCUs are very different spaces um, and that um, amidst the the entry into HBCUs, um, many instances in history where Black people um, have fought for their own liberty and freedoms and inclusion, um, including um, these conventions that I have listed here. So you can look that up if you want. Um, so as we think about HBCUs, um, HBCUs have been a, a space of uh, college access for Black students and continue to be uh, a really important space for college access, but more than that, they are a, a different kind of space to get a college degree, and they continue to be, um, where we see really different, um, different things happening to the students, both in the short and the long term. So I'm going to talk here um, about Erin Gosier Mitchell. She um, has written two of her own um, autobiographies, and um, you should definitely read them. Uh, they, I, I draw on them in this chapter at We Do because we're writing this together. Um, and, um, and she's a really um, lovely writer, does just really great, interesting uh, writing that you should read. Uh, and so we're going to tell a different part of her story that isn't in these two books here, um, but I do want to note her as a co-author here too. Some facts. So Erin, so she was born in Selma, Alabama in 1935, so deep in the Jim Crow South, uh, and um, she was definitely born at a time when there was um, not racial integration in schooling or in higher education. So um, the, the world that she's born into, you know, she, she didn't even shake a white person's hand until she was in college. So she was so segregated in her life that um, she just really wasn't in spaces with white people at all until she was in college. She, um, she didn't even go into to a movie theater in her, in her hometown until 1991 um, because of that Jim Crow South um, racial segregation history. Um, it just didn't feel comfortable to her until that time. She graduated Spelman College, which is a um, liberal arts institution. Um, that's a women's college. That's a HBCU in Atlanta, Georgia. She graduated in 1955. She later earned a master's degree. Um, she was a, a musician and uh, she's a retired school teacher. At the time. Um, so I'm just going to um, talk about a couple pieces of her story. She talked about Spellman being the window to her world. So keep in mind, she's in this very racially segregated world. My phone is, is ringing, which is so odd to me because I haven't been in my office for so long. Um, so she talks about Spellman um, and, and how she hadn't even sh um, shaken a hand with a white person until she went to Spellman. Um, how Spelman opened up this whole new world for her. Um, they had, um, they had a, um, a, a thing called chapel that was um, regularly attended by the women who went to Spelman College. And, um, and many of the, um, 
of the civil rights leaders at the time actually came and spoke at Spelman. Um, so she, uh, you can read that for yourself, but some of the big, big um, activists and thinkers at the time um, came to Spelman and spoke to these women. So essentially what they were doing in the 1950s is um, once women got into the gates and there are gates around Spelman, um, once women got there, they were creating this different world there that was not the Jim Crow South. So they were bringing people in um, of, of all different racial groups to speak to these women and to build a different kind of world uh, for women and a different kind of confidence and, and sense of self. So as she says, we were black and proud at Spelman always. Um, so um, she talks about how um, Spelman was also a place that was very, very protected. Um, at the president at the time, um, talked to the women about, she didn't, the president didn't even want the women at Spelman to go to segregated spaces because she didn't want them to suffer the indignity of having to deal with um, this wrongful racial segregationist um, Jim Crow policy. So they, they were not allowed to go to movies. They weren't allowed to go to anything unless it was a Spelman approved event. Um, and, and the one thing they were allowed to do um, outside, on the outside that would have been a, a segregated space was the symphony. Um, so they, in many ways, were trying to, at the time, build this um, community and this, this whole space um, that would actually resist and push back on the segregation. Um, so she talks about Spel Spelman as service. Um, she talks about even with her children and next to, you know, you owe Spelman, Spelman was great for me. Um, she was still very, very involved with that Spelman, um, even, even well into her um, now 80s. Um, so she's very, um, she still goes back, she still visits, um, very, very involved. Um, so I'm going to sum it up so we can talk. Um, at at PWIs, this legacy of greatness, this intergenerational idea of what sustains and elevates Black women through college and then in, into their lives. At, at PWIs, this greatness, I, this idea of greatness was really built out of resistance um, by Black women and men, um, starting Black student unions, um, protesting for civil rights, asking for what was owed to them, just basic uh, basic liberties that they should have been owed as students. And, and that's how greatness was built, but it was, it was out of resistance to this, um, what had been a segregated space that Black students were entering um, and have entered. Um, it did, however, and does still come at a cost, um, it came at a cost to Janelle's health. Uh, I can tell you more about the project I'm doing right now, but um, PWIs still come at a cost to many Black women um, and their health um, being in PWIs. And so, um, so it's still something to be concerned about that um, these spaces are not still to this day, healthy spaces um, for black students um, and faculty to be. Um, and then at HBCUs, um, greatness was fostered by the institution itself and the black women in it. So it was this community space between um, the institution and, and the black women in the space. Um, greatness um, was intergenerational um, at Spelman in particular. Um, it was as if she was entering something that had come long before her and that she needed to be a part of pushing that forward into the future. So my question then is who needs to take responsibility for supporting students and what, um, and what does that mean about our values um, in higher education? Um, for Janelle at the PWI, community with other Black women and men was really imperative. Um, and, and even before she got there, it was imperative um, because her high school counselor is the person that provided the most access um, to college, um, the Black Student Union. Um, once she got to college, civil rights protests, even the president becomes part of this community um, in a way, but built out of protest. Um, she did have a partner that um, is in her larger story and was a very significant part of supporting her too. Um, for Erin at the HBCU, there's a typo there, I apologize. Um, this just should be one, one C. Um, community with other Black women and, and men was also imperative, um, but it was built out of the institutional space, the sisterhood. Um, faculty um, and administrator representation. I didn't share this part of her story, but she did talk a lot about how it was very important that she saw um, faculty and administrators who were Black uh, and Black women in particular. Um, it was a counter space to the Jim Crow South. Um, and then her continued involvement sustained that community, not just for her, but for the future. 
Okay, so it's time to talk to each other. I left us just about 20 minutes. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see people's faces and, and at least know who's speaking. Um, so I wanna hear from, from you. Okay, as always, if you wanna use the chat or use the uh, Zoom tools to show if you have a question or just jump in. Hi, I have a question. Um, so thank you for coming. I really appreciate this talk. Um, I am wondering in like position in your positionality as a white woman who works at a white university, um, I absolutely love and appreciate the way you position um, the black women as authors and co-editors of their stories. But I'm um, just wondering how you think about your work and telling the stories of these women, especially in the position you're at. And I'm just wondering, what do you like if people are doing this work, like how, I guess I'm wondering how do you think they go about like being part of the solution, you know, as, you know, as well as telling the stories of other people? Oh, it's really, really good question. I'm, I'm glad you asked it so that we can have a little conversation about it. So feel free to, for, to jump back in too, um, as, I'm, as I'm talking with follow-up if you want. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would say um, across my career, this has been a, a lifelong career long process for me uh, to continually return to my positioning as a white woman um, and, um, and how to do the work that I do, which is essentially crossing racial lines and trying to bridge um, boundaries with black women, how to do that in ways that um, elevate Black women and elevate Black women's ability to tell their own stories and, their, and, and, and author their own lives. Um, and um, how do I do that work um, in ways that can then translate it to other people um, and translate it to even, even you know, people who aren't Black women. Um, but you know, for me, I would say my first audience and my first, um, my first responsibility and obligation is to, to Black women and to the um, black women in the study um, in particular and um, and I just don't care about the, the rest as much and so at, um, I am constantly working with um, the black women that I engage in my work um, to make sure that the work is working for them <laughs> um, which means that I, um, I have to constantly ask the question um, you know, is this okay to tell this story? Do you want to author this with me? This is, I, I, it's not just me who can tell this story, obviously. Um, you know, is there, um, is there time and space where sometimes um, data from the project maybe um, has me as the last author or not even an author, you know, um, right? So, so thinking about everything from authorship to um, how do I engage people when I actually um, meet with them? Um, all of that's on the table all the time. And the thing I often tell to people who want to do this work who are white um, is that if you're going to do this work, um, your credibility is always and forever up for grabs, meaning every single moment that you do the work, every single moment, not just when you're meeting with a participant, but when you're writing, when you're publishing, when you're going out and speaking, um, every single moment is an opportunity to either build trust and build community, which is what I've learned from the Black women in this, in this study, um, or it's, a chance, it's, a, it's an opportunity to betray that and to, to cause racial harm. And so if you're gonna do this work, this is what I say to white people who wanna enter that space, every single moment you're, it is, is that teeter-totter between those two things. And sometimes um, it's gonna go right, and sometimes it's not gonna go right. And, you need people, um, and I have a lot of people, um, to tell you if and when it doesn't go right so that you can try to make it right in the future. Um, so I, I think that's been the way that I've proceeded um, and continue to proceed throughout my career. Um, it means that almost all of my co-authors um, on almost all of my work and a lot of my, most of my work is co-authored now, um, almost all my co-authors are black women. Um, and, and some of them are participants, some of them are not. Um, but it, it also means that 
um, if I'm going to enter this space and try to elevate um, lives of Black men, that um, I need to not be the center voice a lot of the time. I don't know if that answers your question, though. Do you want to, is there a follow up? I just want to make sure I'm answering the question that you're asking. Yeah, I think that's fine. I was also um, thinking about like just, uh, I guess, like advocacy work at the university and make sure like more um, Black doc students are enrolled and, you know, mentored and things of that nature, too. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's also, I, and I will say that, I mean, for me as a critical um, scholar, and I, I say this to students when I teach critical, I teach a critical theory um, and methods class, and, um, and I, I say to them, you know, um, if you're going to do this kind of work, you can't just write about it, you have to live it throughout your whole life. So, um, so one of the ways, for example, that I try to live out this work is, um, by being the admissions chair um, in my department, because um, being admissions chair um, is one way that I can really try to increase uh, the number of students of color that we have in the department. And, and then, um, you know, or for example, trying to create, I created a um, fellowship program um, for doctoral students or students of color um, so that once students are here, they can um, get really, really, really just uh, stellar research training so that they can be really great scholars entering the field um, and, you know, et cetera. So yeah, it, it can't just be the writing. It absolutely has to be the rest of the work. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you asked the question um, and, and got us to, to talk about that. Any other questions? Um, I have a question too. I mean, it's actually two, one of them sort of following up on what you were talking about. Um, I, I'm curious about, so, so you mentioned in these two cases that you're, you're highlighting this sort of process of co-authorship, but I'm, I'm curious because this is such a big project with so many oral okay. histories. If, like, if you do have like a process of, uh, of like dialoguing with all of your participants in some sort of level, a sort of like a member check about like the way you're telling their stories and sort of how you do that, like how you manage this, not just this big amount of data, but also this process. And then my other question uh, is less in like terms of methodology, but just I'm curious if um, you are also, if you also looked at any histories of people in, in college, like I'm thinking about records and how it's like becoming a majority jury minority institution and how this this discourse is also appropriated to sort of like advance the, the university as this sort of woke institution and uh so i'm curious if you have any insights on also that experience like not just predominantly white or historically black colleges but also this transforming spaces mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so i would say um to the to the first um Oh, now I lost the first part of the question. Can you say the first part of the question again? Because I, I started thinking about authors I wanted to share with you. <laughs> the first part of the question was about this like sort of member checking process. Oh, yeah. Considering yes. the, 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 how big your data set is. It's, so I will, I, it, honestly, the member checking process is absolutely overwhelming, um, particularly if, um, if, if you want to, if you want to really like toe the line on making sure that people feel storied in a way that's appropriate to them and or authored. Um, so, so I will say that it is a little bit overwhelming. Um, and I will also say that um, what, one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, as all human relationships go, um, my relationships with um, people that I encounter when I, when I do interviews and do, um, do research, um, they're not all the same. So I might create a really close relationship with somebody and we end up co-authoring together because they really wanted to engage the member checking process at the, at the onset to the extent where finally, you know, after some time I said, you know, I think we should just co-author because it seems like you're really doing a lot of labor here and let's just, let's co-author this if you want to. Some people, when I've come to them and said, do you want to do the member check you know, do you want to check on how you're being presented? They'll be like, I just don't want to do that. You know, I, I don't have time. And so there are people who really don't, you know, 
want to expend more labor. They've already expended the labor to tell me, you know, to work with me and, and share part of their story and that's enough. And so I just try to follow the lead of participants. So, you know, if the participant um, doesn't really want to even do the member check, um, then they don't have to, <laughs> you know, or if they want to do one member check and then they say like, I'm good. You don't need to come back to me again. Then I then I honor that, you know. Or if they um, if I go to them and say you can be as involved as you want to be, and they say I want to be a co-author, then I'll say okay, let's do that too, you know. So I really try to follow the lead of that of the people, and I and I would say that um, as is often the case with qualitative research, a lot of times when we go for member checks, people maybe don't have the space or time or bandwidth to just to deal with it, and sometimes. Um, having to contend with what we said in an interview. I've done interviews for other people's research before. You know, I've been a participant before. Sometimes you don't really want to read what you said. Like it it's it almost brings brings things up again in a way that isn't good for you. So I also try to honor that with participants. Like if they shared a part of a story that was really hard to share and then I come to them with a member check to say, um, hey, do you want to read your transcript or do you want to see how you're being presented? And they say, uh, I just kind of don't want to then it could be too that um, I need to honor the, the way in which going through that again might you know, bring it up for them in a, in a way that could be harmful for them. So all that is to say, um, I, I keep an Excel spreadsheet and I just try to keep track of when I'm contacting, how I'm contacting, who has said yes, no, who has said contact me more, who hasn't, you know, and, and I just, I really do have to be pretty um, organized about it. It can't be loose with, with 105 people. Um, and I have a new study now with 100, um, 100 people and uh, um, who are Black women academics and same thing there. I just have to be super, um, super rigorous on the organization end of things to make sure I'm contacting people in the ways they want to be contacted. Yeah. Really good question. On the on the other histories piece, I would really recommend um, there's a there's a book on um, campus counter spaces by Misery um, Keels K E E L S. I'll put this in the uh, that just came out. Keels. Um, and you, that you should read, um, and that I think is really good to think about just. Um, how particularly predominantly white institutions can become a counter to um, some of the racial segregation that they've had in the past. And then I really like Eddie Cole's um, campus color line history uh, about um, just college campuses and contending with racial history um, on college campuses, some of which in his book are predominantly white too. So I would, those, those might be a good start, but I'm happy to email more too. I'll put my email in the chat for not just you, but for anybody. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? We still have some time. I have a question, Rochelle. Yes. Um, I'm curious. Uh, this is one of the first times I've seen you um, refer to history and mention that you're kind of moving in that direction. And as, yeah, as somebody <laughs> who, who cares a lot about that and uh, often is frustrated by um, scholars not understanding that things actually came before them, um, <laughs> but before their research and, and you know, go, goes way back, especially when it comes to this, this topic in particular. And I was so glad to see that you highlighted black women who've been writing about these topics for so long. Um, but I guess I'm curious, how did you start to get more interested in looking deeper at uh, history and where do you see yourself going? Cause you hinted at that at the beginning. So where do you see yourself going? Yeah, so, you know, I, for my sabbatical, I um, went to the Institute for Research in the Humanities here at UW-Madison, um, and while I didn't, you know, leave the institution or leave the city um, for my sabbatical, it felt like I did in a lot of ways, because I spent a year um, in that, in, so it was a different building, and um, and we and there was like a weekly seminar and we we were mentoring each other on our books and talking a lot about and everybody's everybody was a historian pretty much except for me. Um, and so it was a really good year for me to just try to I, I literally came in and I was like, okay, can you train this social scientist to try to be a historian, um, because I for a long time have thought about, um, you know, good critical theory and good critical 
inquiry grid critical research does contend with history. And I had always felt like um, the, the space that I had not filled out in my own work as a critical scholar was trying to blend social sciences and humanities better. And, and I hadn't done it yet. And so I just was really trying to do that. Um, I also have to give credit to, and people should read this person's work, um, Christy Clark Pujara. She's a, um, she's a good, um, really amazing scholar. She's here at Madison and Afroam in history. Um, and she does work on enslavement um, in, um, in Northern states, like in Wisconsin. She's doing, um, she's writing a book right now about um, enslaved people that were brought from the South to the North and, and lived in Wisconsin. Um, way, way back before people, you know, people are shocked. Uh, and, and, um, and so she, um, she's a good friend of mine, but she uh, had also become a really good reader of my work uh, to, to help me think through ways I was and was not contending with history in my work. Uh, and, um, and the other thing that started to happen for me is I was trying to follow the lead of my participants. And many of my participants, as I was doing these interviews that at the time I was not calling oral histories, uh, I realized that they were reckoning with and calling up history that I needed to know better. And so um, after many interviews, I would, I would have to go and read books and books and books to just understand the context that they were drawing on because many of the women were older than I was. And so I think, you know, as following the lead of the participants, I, I, I found that um, reckoning with and trying to read and understand the history, the, the context that they were drawing on um, was just absolutely vital to understanding their, um, their position and their story and how they were thinking and even the music and art and culture and artifacts that they were um, drawing on at the time. So I, I had also, um, I also really needed to educate myself in, in those ways about um, historical artifacts of just art and music and reading and, you know, so I, I read a lot of um, novels and things that, uh, for example, that some of the participants were referencing. So yeah, I found that the history project needed to extend not just reading other people's histories, but it needed to extend that whole range. Um, and I, um, now I can't go back. So I feel like, um, as I as I go forward with my work, um, even when I frame it in a more social science, um, qualitative methods, critical critical research kind of way, it's always going to have this. Um, I hope um, historical component to it that I will call out um, because I just I I have come to realize, um, and you know, in sociology they would say that you can't study anything without studying social context, but social context is history. You know, there is a history to it that also comes with it. And so, um, yeah, so I, I'm definitely gonna be drawing that forward. Um, the work that I'm doing right now is about black women and, and health outcomes um, in the academy. It's a um, mixed methods study. Um, so it's surveys and, and interviews. Um, and even in that work, I'm thinking a lot about um, the history of Black women in the academy and, and what that has looked like, not just for students, but for faculty and what and how that history is really being carried forward for a lot of people now um, relative to health outcomes, too. So yeah, maybe the history of um, uh, African Americans and and uh, access to health care and medicine, too. I mean, that's really important. So yeah, um, and a lot of a lot of participants in this new study are, you know, definitely referencing an intergenerational history of um, medical math, actually, you know, that has been um, has been um, done to black black people in this country. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's fun. It's fun to it's fun to get to play in new disciplines and and definitely. I mean, I definitely would say I'm a novice historian. <laughs> But I'm trying, I, and I, I'm definitely, um, I want to also allow people to be critical of the way that I'm trying to think about and write history. So when I've given, for example, Christy Clark Pujara, um, some of my writing should be like, you still don't sound like a historian. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm working on that, but um, you know, ultimately my voice will still probably be the same voice, but it hopefully will be historyed better. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I can I can also send some stuff to you, Mary Beth, if you ever have time. <laughs> I can use that critical feedback. Um, okay, I think we've we've actually reached the one o'clock, one o one. So um, 
thank you, uh, Michelle, for joining us today. Uh, this is a good way to end our brown bag series. <laughs> um, so I guess if anyone else has any other questions, the, her uh, email's in the chat and we'll say goodbye. Thank you uh, so much have, for the opportunity. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.